Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with another model showcase video for this 172nd scale USS Shark SSN 591 Skipjack Class Fast Attack Submarine. The model that you see here is both my own personal collection and it's not for sale and or purchase. Generally in these videos I mentioned I take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. However, those are primarily with armor models. This being a submarine, it's not exactly a subject matter that I frequently work in and it's not really a subject matter that I offer commission build services in. However, if anyone is interested in the commission build services that I do offer, I can be reached via the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built static and it's built predominantly out of the box. However, I went ahead and upgraded the detailing with some scratch build details as well as also with the detail upgrade sets that I developed and can be found on the Iron Bottom Sound website. The link is listed below and we'll be going over all of these detail modifications as well as going over the basic kit in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vessel here is the USS Shark, or specifically, because there were several other sharks in U.S. Naval history, the SSN 591. This USS Shark was a Skipjack class fast attack submarine. The submarine itself was originally laid down on the 24th of February 1958, launched on the 16th of March 1960, and then commissioned the following year. As I've mentioned in the other model showcase videos of this boat's sister ships, the Skipjack class was a very influential submarine for the U.S. Navy, as this vessel over here was the first to incorporate two technologies, the nuclear reactor from the USS Nautilus, and most importantly, the teardrop-shaped hull from the Albacore. Prior to this boat over here, submarines were more or less intended for surface running, and they had the ability to submerge, but they were only able to submerge for short durations of time. The time duration was taken care of with the nuclear reactor and with the teardrop shaped hull this gave the vessel some excellent underwater performance. In total there were six boats built in the skipjack class configuration for the US Navy and all six did see service. There were going to be a couple extra however partway during construction they were retrofitted and turned into the George Washington class of SSBNs however that's a topic for another video for another day. Of the six boats that were produced, all of them saw service with the U.S. Navy. Tragically, one of them, the Scorpion, was lost, but the remaining five saw service for the next 30 or so years. Over the years of service, all of the Skipjack class submarines, the Shark included, received several modification refits and upgrades during the course of its service life. These were intended to give the vessel some updated technologies as well as other systems in order to keep the vessels as relevant as they possibly can for the foreseeable service life future. One of the more noticeable changes to the vessel's exterior was a redesign of the propeller. When the vessel was originally launched, it had a five blade propeller, which was basically the same design as we saw on the fleet boats that were upgraded and still in service during this time frame in the Guppy program. However, during the 1960s time frame, the US Navy really wanted to adopt more of a quieter sound signature for their boats and in order to do this the original five blade prop was replaced with one of a new design. The new design featured seven blades and a different type of geometry to it which was more along the lines what was seen on the other boats that were coming off of the design and production line for the US Navy. The new seven blade shark fin prop was much quieter compared to the original five blader that the boat originally had at launch. The same modification was done to basically all of the skipjacks across the board that were still in service at this time and remained on the vessels until the very end of their service life. However, after a certain point, the vessels were really beginning to show their age and after 30 years of service, it was time for the Navy to put this old fish out to pasture. The USS Shark was both decommissioned and stricken by the US Navy on the 15th of September 1990. The Shark, along with the other sister ships, wound up in the submarine recycle program on the 1st of October 1995 at Puget Sound. There, eventually, the submarine was completely scrapped, and the only section that still remains today is a small segment of the hull which contains the nuclear reactor. That section, along with many of the other hull sections from its fellow sister ships, are all currently in a secure location in a large outdoor pit in the state of Washington. 
Just as a quick background, this model here is a 172nd scale USS Skipjack kit from the company Mobius. It is an all plastic injection molded kit and it's been on the market now for about 10 years or so. The model was procured from Amazon.com. I paid nothing for it because I had some saved up credit card points, but these kits generally run anywhere between 95 to about 110 US dollars. The models are made primarily out of injection molded polystyrene, just as you know your typical plastic model kit. This kit does also supply you some parts made out of clear plastic, and also it gives you some parts made out of photo etch. If anyone is curious to know exactly what the kit gives you out of the box, I recommend pausing this video and checking out one of the earlier Skipjack videos that I've built on this channel. There I go into more depth and give the model a thorough full unboxing. The links can not just be found on the ECA channel, but are also found in the video description listed below. These models here are sold as a static format, and that's how this one here is built. However, it's not uncommon for a lot of people to RC convert them. That's something that's way out of the scope of this video. However, I do recommend checking out some other videos on YouTube where there are people who have thorough reviews and modification videos that show this model being converted from static display to RC use. However, with that out of the way, let's continue with the video. So here's the model going through its construction. At this point here, the two halves on the upper and lower sections of the hull have been assembled. They've been glued together, and one thing that I have touched upon in a few other videos is that sometimes I've ran to these kits where the fit needs a little bit more coercing in order to get it to the appropriate shape. However, I've also built several of these models where that's just not the case, and it seems like it's a luck of the draw. Fortunately for this particular model here, it's definitely the latter. This model went together pretty well, and not a whole lot of jigging work was required in order to get the two halves together. So, what more than likely this means that this is probably a batch type situation, and the current kits that are on the market right now, as I recently purchased this one, have the hulls at the appropriate shape out of the box and very little coercion is necessary in order to get them glued together. Of course, even though the halves fit together very well, you still are going to have some seam work to contend with, and this is just par for the course when working on these skipjacks. At the moment, I went ahead and did the bodywork on the midsections here on the top, and the same thing was also done to the bottom. It's not on screen at the moment, obviously, but rest assured the exact same procedure was done. This is using just red putty, where I applied it, and I went through the steps to polish it down. This is definitely just the foundation coat because I'm pretty sure that once the upper and lower hull halves go together, there's going to be a bunch more putty work that needs to be done. One of one, which is going to be the water line here, which is something that I always mention in these skipjack videos. And the second is the most clear and obvious one, where it's the actual seam line where the two halves connect together. However, I'm not going to go into too much information about that because, well, I frankly already did that in great depth in the scamp video that can be found in the link listed below in the video description. So on this one over here, at the moment, this is ready to go to the next step where it's actually going to be plugged together with the lower hull section. However, before I do, this is the time where I go ahead and make some detail modifications in order to add the iron bottom sound HD3D printed components to the deck sections over here, specifically the inserts for the, the stern and the bow hatches. The hatches that are integrally molded into the kit, as I've mentioned on several of these videos now, does have the section scribed in. However, the detailing is very basic on them, and in order to improve the detailing, I developed these inserts that we have right here that have the appropriate detailing for these pieces, and with the way they are installed, they are installed from underneath. So obviously this has to be done before the hull is assembled. The removal is done with a Dremel and a needle file, and you basically just color within the lines is the best way to put it, where, as I mentioned before, the sections are scribed in place, and so you have a perfect visual indentation on where the material needs to be removed and how much of it needs to be removed as well. In addition to that, there are, of course, going to be much more details that are going to be added to the surface here, like fastener locations, the eyelet locations, as well as even the little hooks that are found on these two sections, but more on that will be discussed towards the latter half of the video. At this point, though, this is where, obviously, you need to get the hull prepped in order for the hatches to be installed. Here, where I went ahead and removed the piece of material for the rear tie-down section. However, this is something that I usually install after the model is assembled, or the two halves are assembled, but since I'm already going through the grinding process, I might as well go ahead and take care of it at this point here. On the bow section, I went ahead and removed it too. However, I did have a small little nick with the Dremel. It was just a 
a surface scratch. It was definitely polished away with some red putty. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Although that is a poor example, but you know, what the hell, it's still a funny clip regardless. Uh, there's going to be another hole cut into this section over here for the front tie down, which will look just like this one over here. However, this is something that I generally do after the model is fully assembled at that point as well. And also there's some other equipment that gets mounted here on the front, but again, we'll see, or I should say I'll touch upon that as the video progresses. The next thing I want to touch upon is with the Iron Bottom Sound set. So here's the IBS set right here. It's all HD 3D printed components. and all of these parts are going to be used to upgrade the model from the kit condition that we have here. As I mentioned in a few of the other videos, this set does supply with plenty of spares, so in case there's a mishap or two, you can easily go ahead and continue with the build. That's true for most of the components except for some of the larger ones like the hatches themselves as well as also the snorkel induction, to name a few. However, for the small fiddly bits, the piece that generally get broken pretty easily, I do have your back and there are quite a few extras that are supplied on this sprue here. So, back to the insulation, here we have the insert itself. And the way the insert is going to be installed is first you have to remove it off this, the, the platform. And the way I did it on this one is in the past you can use a clean cut snip and just snip the little column off on the bottom to free the component. That does work. However, another technique that I've been using on these components is with the use of a Dremel. Here I have a Dremel with a miniature router bit. These bits here are procured from the vendor listed below right here as well as you can find a direct link in the video description. With the router bit, you can actually just remove the material of the column that's right here on the bottom. Because this is translucent, you know exactly where the column resides. So for instance, uh, let me see if I can remove one of these eyelets over here. There's the eyelet right there. I'm gonna start with this one. Turn on the Dremel. Now I'm just gonna carefully, obviously you wanna have your hand cupped over here so when the piece falls out, it just falls into your hand. So you're going to Lost Partia. Seems a little tricky to get on camera, but I just go right in here. And there you go. After a little bit of material removal, you can see the piece just simply dropped out nice and peacefully, and it didn't cause any sort of destruction to any of the other components. If you use a clean sn cut snip, this will obviously work too. However, you run the risk of trying to get into some of these locations with the snip, may be a bit difficult. And also the actual snipping process itself can possibly cause a shock to some of these smaller fiddly bits and potentially loosen them or break them off as well. And they can, they may be able to break off in a manner that's not exactly controlled. So obviously it could still be done, but I prefer the Dremel technique because it's just a little bit easier and less obtrusive compared to the other techniques. So now that you've seen what the pieces look like, how they were moved, from this point here, I'm going to install them. And one trick that I noticed from the previous builds, and it's kind of something that was unintentional, is that when you remove the piece, we have this little stem sticking out from the bottom, and this stem acts as a perfect location for you to simply hold onto the part for installation. So to install a component to the model, I got my super glue right here. I'm just going to add a few little drops. right here on the bottom plate. And then, it's kind of like playing that old operation game. You just take the piece and plug it into place. With the way the unit is designed, it's, supposed, it's a self-leveling type installation where no matter how you do the install, it's going to be at the appropriate height, so no other fiddling is required. You simply just drill out the, the section, remove off the sprue, glue, and then drop the piece directly into place. Like so. Simple and sweet. As you can see, like I just mentioned, it goes on in a self-leveling manner and no other work is required. When you are applying the glue, you wanna be careful not to put too much in place because when the glue smushes in, it can potentially go into the little recess over there between the hatch and the model and it'll ooze out on the outside, which something that can actually hurt the look as opposed to helping it because with the way the system is, you will have a perfect little seam line right there where the two sections meet each other, which is exactly what you want to see because, well, that's how it is on the real boat. So I'm going to do the same thing now to the one on the front. 
Also, you want to be careful with that little hook that we have here. It's a very easily broken component, but that's just the nature of the beast. If it breaks, it's something that could either be just glued on in place if you find it, or just fabricate a new one out of, out of metal wire, either of which I've actually done in the past. But if you're careful, and you're, you know, you know what you're doing when handling one of these models, you could actually get through the build without breaking one of these, as I've actually done about two times already. So, uh, I guess, you know, with repetition comes perfection. So, as you can see, I just put full, four little drops of glue on this one. And I'm just going to go ahead, line it up, and drop it directly into place. No other prep work is required to the piece itself. You don't have to trim anything. You don't have to adjust anything. Just snip and drop on and you're done and that's what it looks like from the outside if you want to add a little bit more glue you definitely can if you think that those four little drops is not good enough but you could easily just on the inside add a small little bead of glue right here for this you want to use super glue you cannot just use standard cement or god forbid testers red tube i don't know why anyone would use testers red tube it's a garbage material but a lot of individuals out there still like to use that stuff generally older individuals since they've been using it forever but if you are going to go with this type of option super glue is the way to go you cannot use standard model glue on this because the 3d printed components made out of resin and polystyrene and resin will not bond with a tooling based cement so that's something to definitely keep in mind while I have the piece upside down, might as well add a few little drops here on the rear section as well. And there we have it. The pieces are now fully installed. And from here, I can actually go ahead and get the upper and lower hull sections together. However, I'm, there's no point showing that on video because, well, I've already done that to great extent in the scamp video. Again, the link is found in the description below. So starting with the model's hull, basically every aspect of this build is going to be an exercise with bodywork. And the hull here is absolutely no exception. As we saw before, the hull consists of four segments that are glued together and then the upper and lower sections are plugged together. The model will have quite a bit of seam work in this location with just the two areas where the upper and lower hulls meet as well with the two areas where they plug together. Obviously this is something that needs to be addressed by the builder in order to improve the look of the model. On the model over here, the bodywork was concluded with the use of both red putty as well as also thick super glue. Once everything was sanded repeatedly with both dry and wet sanding of various grits, at least for the seamless appearance that we have right here. In addition to the bodywork where the hull sections connect, another area that I like to putty up on these builds is with the line here that's found on the water line. With the way the kit is molded, they have this integral line molded into this section over here and this tells the builder where the water line needs to be painted. Unfortunately, in my opinion, it kind of hurts the look of the build. So in order to improve the models further, I went ahead and also polished them down with the bodywork as well. Again, same exact techniques were utilized with the same materials. Red putty as well as super glue and then the various methods of sanding. On the sanding work, the side sections are fairly easily done. The biggest area though that the builder does need to pay attention to is the nose. Out of all the locations on the model, the nose is definitely the most noteworthy because of the molded in panel line sections. We have here the two sonar sections as well as also the torpedo doors. These are integrally molded into the kit with recessed panel lines. However, with the way that things molded, you do have to be very careful with the putty work on both the waterline area as well as the upper and lower hull sections because you can easily polish away the panel line surfaces that are found on these areas. In addition to that, with the way the kit is molded, the panel lines are there, but they're not really that deep carved into the plastic. So this is why, again, when you're sanding things down, you can easily over polish everything and lose the torpedo door. On the model over here, in order to counteract that after the bodywork is concluded, I take a worn out needle from one of my airbrushes and I actually go ahead and I use that as an etch tool and I re-etch out the panel lines accordingly. This is done for all the various locations. After the etch work is done, it leads for some very nice results that you can see here. Also on the bodywork, I do want to mention the midrift area. You do have to polish this down, but it's obviously this is best done before the sail is glued on in place. So this is so you have clear access to get in here and polish down the amount of bodywork that's needed in order to get them all to look nice and smooth.
And the very last thing I do want to mention about the hull bodywork is with the tail. With the way that the model is designed, these sections here are integrally molded into the upper and lower hulls, and then you have to sandwich the dive planes into these areas when everything gets glued together. Obviously, there's going to be a ton of bodywork here. Well, not so much a ton of bodywork, but you do have to be careful with the bodywork that needs to be done. So, you will have a seam that runs along this section over here, along the fin, and then you will also have that seam continuing on this area here. So you have to basically get the fin out of the way in order to thoroughly polish it down. Fortunately, on this kit, these sections here are movable, so you can pivot them out of the way and get in there with some sandpaper to do what you have to do. On the fins themselves, you also have to do bodywork on them because these are also a two-part assembly and there is some bodywork to contend with. Again, very easily done, but this is actually technically the first thing you got to do before you could even start with the other hull assembly processes. With the model rolled over and placed on its side, I do want to mention some areas here on the lower hull. First, I do love the molding detailing found on this kit. They did a fantastic job with molding in the vent and draining detailing that's found on the lower section of the hull. These are nicely molded and to make them pop, to me a panel line accent is going to be your best friend. The other thing I do want to mention is again some body work that needs to be done on the lower sections over here. With the way this stock kit is designed, it has a plug-on type stand system where you have these two little rectangle sections with a column and they plug into two holes that are molded into the lower hull. The stand design is pretty efficient in that it does hold the model up pretty well. However, it's not something that I personally like on my ship models and I do like the model to have a nice clean hull. So, Instead of using the kit one, the kit stands were obviously not utilized for this one here that I'll touch upon in a minute, but the locations that were molded into the bottom were plugged up and blended in with the bodywork, leaving for the results that you see here. Back onto the stand, again, the stand is the unsung hero on all ship models, and generally the ones that come with the kits are terrible. The one that you see here is a copy of the Ravel 172nd scale USS Gato submarine stand that I've mentioned in a few of these videos. That kit actually has a remarkably great stand, and what we did was we actually made a clone of the two sections that you see in here and here. These are casted in resin, and then for the center portion, I just use a PVC tube. Drill the two sections out on the drill press, cut the tube to shape, glue it together, and ta-da, you now have a very efficient stand. The stand does a great job with holding the skipjack on, and it's nice and long enough, or I should say you can make it nice and long enough, so that it supports it thoroughly. It's also a low-profile stand, and it's also one that is great if you have a shelf display, and it doesn't take up too much space. One other thing I want to mention about the stand, and again, this is something I frequently mention, is on the locations where the stand makes contact with the hull, I went ahead and covered it with some masking tape. This is to act as a barrier and as a protector that shields or mitigates as much as possible any sort of scratching or marring that could be done on the paint itself. This is another common thing that you'll see on many ship models out there where it makes contact with the stand. They, these areas here tend to be scratched up just from general handling. By adding the masking tape over here, this does a great job to add a barrier. Now, one thing I also want to mention is that you want to be careful what material you use because if you use a rubber or some other type of a similar material, this can actually cause harm to the paint finish and after a while, the rubber can actually damage the paint that's found on these locations. So that's not exactly doing you any favors. From my experience here, the masking tape is a nice inert substance. It gives you a nice soft layer, and it also does not have any sort of negative effects on the paint or finish found on the model. On the tape itself, I add about two or three layers of masking tape just to build up that little cushion to the way you see it here. Moving all the way to the aft of the model brings us to the propeller. The propeller that you see here is not the stock original one. This is the second generation shark blade prop, and this is a 3D printed component from Iron Bottom Sound. The unit is a drop-in installation and replacement for the stock version found on the Mobius. The Mobius prop is actually really good. It's a two-piece assembly and it does do the job very nicely. However, that is replicating the earlier five-blade prop, which is what these vessels would have had when originally launched and commissioned. However, at some point in the mid-1960s, they went ahead and swapped out those props with this design over here because this prop gives a quieter sound signature, which was something that the Navy at that time was really trying to push on their submarines. Moving from the prop takes us to the zinc plates. One common feature found on American vessels all the way back 
probably even before the World War I time frame, but specifically with submarines, is that on several locations on the lower hull, they add zinc plates in order to mitigate corrosion. And these nukes over here are absolutely no different. On these American pattern nuclear subs, they tend to be in a cluster of four, found on the four locations here in between the fins and the rudders. These are kit supplied and are a very nice bit of detailing. The only thing that the builder really needs to pay attention to is the paintwork. The best paint the zinc plates, I like to use silver spray paint, and then I go ahead and weather it accordingly. This is best done off of the model and done while still on the spruce because once you add them to the model, trying to paint these areas over here with a brush is going to be a bit problematic and it's just more easily done when painted off the model than added at the tail end. On the reverse side of the hull takes it to a manhole cover and the kit does have lots of these axis panels that are integrally molded into not just the hull but also onto the sail and it's a nice touch. However, one bit of detailing that's absent are the countersunk fasteners which would be found on the real units. On this model over here I add them my usual format with the use of a small Dremel bit on a pin vise. Once the indentations are added to all these areas it really adds to the accuracy and detailing of the build overall. Carrying upward takes it to the beacon here found on the rear section of the rudder. The purpose of this beacon is to indicate when this thing is in port that, hey, there's a giant rudder over here, don't crash into it. With the way these subs are, they do have kind of like a false waterline where, you know, you see the majority of the submarine over here and it looks like the boat ends right there. But that's not the case because you do have a big chunk of the rudder sticking above the waterline. And the beacon is originally integrally molded into the the tail fin. However, one change that I make is with the addition of the IBS component and the IBS part is made out of HD 3D printed material and it's translucent in color. This leads for some very good accuracy found on this part and also the geometry on the part is much more representative of the real unit compared to the molding and kit one. The piece just drops you directly into place, you just polish down the original dome that's molded in this section over here, snip the IBS one off the sprue and just mount it onto the appropriate location and you're good to go. Moving onward brings us to these two caps that we have right here on the lower portion of the hull and this is a mirror image on the opposite side. The reason why I'm mentioning these components here because one they are very nicely detailed and two the kit supplies you these as photo wedge components which is a very very nice touch. The photo wedge just simply gets bent to the curvature of the hull itself and then they get it glued on in the appropriate format. Once they are fitted in place they really do an excellent job of giving this model much more detailed fidelity. Also on this area of the hull, I do want to mention several sections that are integrally molded in as little divots. And on this model here as well and some of my others, I drilled them out with a pin vise or a Dremel just to give the model just a little bit more extra detailing. These pieces, again, or I should say these areas are already molded into the model. And, you know, just drilling them out, it's just an easier way to give the model just a little bit more polish. Going back topside takes it to the remainder of the rear section details, which would consist of many detail components from the iron bottom sound set. This would consist of the rear tie down point that we have right here, as well as the various cleats and the roller section that's also found in this location. And of course, not to mention the replacement of the stock rear escape trunk with the IBS replacement counterpart. So all the mentioned details are all again made out of the same HD material that were mentioned before and here's what they look like fitted in place. For the cleats these are just fitted on top of the model's pre-existing locations. The only thing that you could do extra is to drill a small little hole in the center of the kit areas and that stem that's used to connect the IBS cleat to the sprue or to the base plate I should say is just used as a alignment peg and you just glue them in place once the holes are drilled. Same is also true for the roller in that regard. Once the, these details are added in place, you really get to see just how much more detailing it gives an otherwise pretty plain and basic model. It's also important to mention that the tie down details I just mentioned are exclusively for when the submarine would be at dock. And then once the vessel would be out at sea, these are all retracted, leaving for a sleek appearance and it gives the submarine greater underwater mobility. With the camera brought in closer, you get to see the rear hatch detailing and better focus. As well as also the tie down points that we have right here on all four sides. These locations are integrally molded into the kit and the only thing that you have to do is drill them out with a small pin vise or, or I should say a small Dremel bit and a pin vise and then you just make replacements out of small wire. The wire that you see here is very thin floor wire, it can be found in any sort of craft store and it's what I use on things like antennas and other little grab handles found on my other models. For this one here they did the job absolutely perfectly and it's a mirror image on the 
escape trunk found in the front. Also in this section over here, you get to see the other access panels that I was referencing before, and you can see what they look like with the countersunk details added in place. One other thing I do also want to mention is the small little eyelet found in the center here of the rear marker buoy. This is again a bit of detailing that's absent on the kit, and it's one that's very easily fabricated and added. And once fitted in place, it does give some extra accuracy to the build. Same thing, of course, is also going to be found on the marker buoy found on the front portion of the bow. And on that note, here we have the front bow detailing. Again, the same IBS details are fitted in place. The cleats, the roller, the escape trunk, and the front tie-down point. However, on this one, I also added some extra details that are found on the on the Scorpion detail set. And on the Scorpion set, not only does it consist of the same details I just mentioned, but it also gives you an extra uh, a sonar dome found here on the front, or a hydrofoam. Not really sure what it is, but it's there on the real one. On the Scorpion set, there are two versions available. One is this version that we have here that has the fiberglass dome fitted in place. And then there's another option that has the unit with the fiberglass dome missing. As for why this is the case, well, I referenced that in the Scorpion video, but basically at some point in time, the top part was, fell off, probably out at sea. And you can see the detailing of the equipment underneath. Also found on the set is this little dome that we have here. I have no idea what it's for, but it's found on the real one. So ergo, it's going to be found on the e on the IBS set and fitted to the model. Once all these details are added, again, you can really see just how much extra kick they give the model compared to just leaving it in the stock format. It's also important to point out that you can build the model in its stock configuration and still be accurate. The following fittings of these extra sonar domes that I mentioned here, as well as some of the other fittings that I am going to be touching upon on the sale, these are added in a, at a later date. Again, so this boat here is really more or less resembling the Shark or any of the skipjacks from the mid to late 1960s time frame. And that's basically all there is to mention about the hull, and this brings us to the sail. And the sail is where the remainder of the detailing was added and modified. You see, this build here is basically identical to the Scorpion build that I built a little while ago with the details added in place, but also with several of the scratch build mods that need to have been added as well. This again has to do with the era that I was representing this submarine. Because it was a later version, I had to go ahead and make this, the appropriate modifications. And one of which is with the spine that we have here. The Skipjack class is very distinctive of having the spine in the rear section of the sail. And this is actually to conceal the diesel induction. And I know what you're thinking, but John, this is a nuclear powered submarine. What the hell is it doing with a diesel induction snorkel system? Well, all atomic submarines have a backup diesel system and the Skipjack here is no exception. This here is the exhaust snorkel for and the induction for the diesel engine much along you see or same lines you see out in the guppy and other things similar like that but regardless the the plumbing goes down and then connects to a tube that runs in this section over here and enters back into the hull and in order to conceal the plumbing they have this distinctive spine right here on the sail and when the submarine was first launched it actually has a cutout in this area over here and it's actually a really nice bit of detailing sadly this was the one feature that was omitted when the submarines were eventually refitted to the configuration that we have here. So the spine need to have that section filled in and this was filled in with a length of Plastruct or Evergreen plastic strip. The styrene strip was just simply cut the shape, glued in place and then blended in with the bodywork leading for the result that you have here. As you can see, once that modification is made, it really leads for a nice seamless appearance that would be better replicating the actual unit. On the top portion over here, we do have some nice integrally molded on limber holes. However, in order to improve the model further, I just simply drilled the limber holes out with the pin vise much along the lines as I touched upon on a few other fittings on this model. They just get drilled out, leaving for a very nice bit of detailing that you see here. And it's a great, easy way to add any sort of extra detailing to any of the skipjacks, be it early or late. From the spine brings us to the actual sail itself. And the first thing I do want to mention are all of the access panels that are found on the side of the sail. And these are all integrally molded in and that was an excellent bit of detailing. However, just like with the ones on the hull, the countersunk fasteners were omitted. So in order to improve the model, you guessed it, pin vise, small dremel bit, and a little bit of time later, you'll have the detailing that you see here. The same exact detailing was also done on the panels found on the opposite side, which, you can see presently. 
The other bit of detailing that was scratch built on this model are these little straps that we have here on the side of the sail. And this is also a mirror image on the opposite side. For a while, I was kind of curious on exactly what these straps are for, but I actually found a photograph of what this thing actually is for, and you can probably see it right here on the lower portion of the screen. Basically, this was for a scaffolding. You can plug a scaffolding onto this section over here, and this gives the ability for the crews to work on the top portion of the sail without any problems. The straps were fabricated out of thin strips of soda can aluminum. I basically cut the shape, bent them, and then secured them onto the following location. The locations are very picky. There is a set format to them. And fortunately, there are some really high res photographs of not just the shark, but I believe also of scorpion that have the exact same details in place. So following them is something that can be relatively easily done. And once done, it definitely changes the look of the, this build compared to the original at launch configuration. Moving forward takes us to the navigation beacons, and of course the skipjack is no different from any other boat or vessel where it has its port and storeboard navigation lights present. Just like with the cleats that I mentioned before, when the submarine is underway, these sections here are all retracted, leaving for a nice sleek appearance, and it gives less water drag. But again, when you're going to port, these things open up, leaving for the detailing that you see here. The Locations are integrally printed on the sail, as again, the sail replicates the vessel in its underway mode. So when it comes time for adding these details, it's really easily done. You just remove them off the sprue, paint them, then secure them in place, and basically you just align them on the kit locations. Once added in place, you can really see just how much extra detailing it gives the sail, and it really fleshes it out. Because these components are made out of HD translucent material, this also makes them very realistic once fully painted and completed. You have to carefully just paint the areas here with a brush around the lens areas, and you just leave the lens areas in their natural translucent material. On the back portion, I paint them red or green, depending on the side, and then once everything's fit in place, it, it gives for some very realistic looking results like you see here. This is the red side, and on the opposite side, you can see what it looks like with everything painted in green. On the very front of the sail, it takes us to directly the siren. The siren is emitted on the Mobius kit, but it is supplied with the IBS components. It just drops directly into place, utilizing the kit location that you see here. Once the piece is added, it does give for, again, some more complete detailing. On the front portion, there is a little guard that is present. This was made out of flattened piece of wire, cut the shape, and then mounted into the location, giving for the final end result that you see presently. Also on this portion of the sail, you get to see the windows found on the sail. These are the kit supply ones. They are very nicely done because they are molded in clear plastic, as is the rear beacon light right over here. For the rear beacon, the rear portion is painted yellow, so when you see the submarine from the rear sections, it, it glows in its yellow color, which would be very reminiscent of the actual boat. Back to the windows, in order to secure these in place, this is again done at the very tail end of the build, and it's glued in place with the use of Elmer's white glue. White glue is great for gluing these components on because it does not harm the plastic finish, and it dries to basically a translucent manner. Also, in case there's a mishap or a, or a mistake, you can simply just take the piece off, clean it off, and it, again, it causes no permanent damage to the clear plastic whatsoever. So you do have a nice insurance policy on your hands. If you are making the submarine radio controlled, obviously you don't want to just use standard white glue, but I would definitely recommend utilizing the waterproof wood glue for the same application. It has the same benefits, but again, it's waterproof, which is definitely going to be needed if you're building this thing in an RC format. Moving upward takes to some changes now to the stock Mobius model. Again, the stock kit is representing an earlier version of the Skipjack, and when this thing was first launched, it had four sets of windows, two, two on the very top and two on the bottom. After a few refits, this was changed to the configuration that we have here, where instead of the window section, we now have a new piece of equipment in a dome found in the front portion of the sail. The dome is a HD 3D component from the IBS set. However, you need to modify the kit one in order to secure this in place. To do this, the clear plastic windows are simply just glued to the submarine, and then you basically do a little bit of body work to flare everything in. After they are glued in place and everything is all set, you then drill out the center portion here with the Dremel, and then the new dome just slides in place, giving you for the end result that you see presently. The last bit of detailing to mention, of course, is the array, and this is the heart of any submarine build, regardless of class and or country. So 
you're gonna see here a mix of the IBS parts as well as with the kit components. Basically, all of the kit components were utilized with the exception of two. You have the yellow beacon right over here. This is the iron bottom sound component. The original one is supplied with the model, but it again is made out of standard opaque plastic. The geometry on the stock one, it's okay at best. However, with the IBS one, you really got to see just how much more improved it looks overall. The IBS one, again, is made out of that translucent material, so you could paint the under portions before you paint the rim black, and it will give her, again, some very realistic results that you see here, which is quite frankly impossible to obtain with just painting opaque plastic. The stem is the plastic one. I just simply removed the molded in beacon, and then the IBS one just plugs directly into place with no drilling being necessary. The next IBS component is probably one of my favorite on this entire boat, and that's the snorkel induction. The snorkel induction that's applied on the model has this stem integrally molded in, and has a very simplistic and basic top end. On the model over here, you can see that the top end was cut off, and it was replaced with the IBS one. The IBS one is far more accurate compared to the molded in version, and it has all of its inner baffle detailing for both the induction as well as also the exhaust. This section here in the front would be your induction. This is where clean air would flow in. And this grill section over here is where the diesel exhaust smoke would, would, uh, would be propelled outward. On the top portion, there's a beacon and there are two options of beacon, an early pattern and a late pattern. This here is the later pattern and the difference is with the geometry. And yes, both versions are supplied with the IBS set. The remainder of the array is all 100% stock with the Mobius kit, and the array is actually pretty good for what it is. They are two half assemblies, so guess what? Seam work is going to be needed to be polished away, but once they are done, at least for some pretty good results. The paintwork on these are in my typical format, where the fairings themselves are painted in a light gray color, and then we have some camouflage added in the form of some blobs. Just like I mentioned on the other Skipjack videos, you do have some creative licensing on exactly the style and color to use on these, on these sections, as they did change between the different yards. Some of them were applied with a paintbrush, some of them were applied with the spray gun, either which are accurate, it just depends on your tooling and also just your personal taste. For this one here, the blotches were applied via the paintbrush. And the very last thing I do want to mention involves the periscopes. And this is a mistake I've seen far too common on many builds out there on YouTube. And that is when anyone builds these periscopes, they tend to paint them in the same format. And that's just not the case. On these American submarines, specifically these Cold War ones, the one scope, the material is a shiny aluminum color. And without fail, the color on the other scope is always a darker greenish, gray, pinkish type materials. One of those things where you just have to see it to know what I'm talking about. So on the model over here, I painted them accordingly. This one here, I just utilized the same silver spray paint that I utilized for the, the snorkel. While this one over here, I utilized first a base coat of the silver, and then I brushed over it with the Vallejo oily steel. And that leads for the results that you see presently. And again, it's just one of those little things that when you add to your boat, it just makes it look all that much more fleshed out. And that's all there is to the detailing. This brings us to the paint and the weathering work. So first, I do want to always mention that there's a stigma with these modern American nuclear submarines in that they're very boring with their paintwork, and that couldn't be any further from the truth. This is so far my fifth Skipjack class sub that I've done, and no two of them have looked alike so far. When it comes to these vessels, there are quite a bunch of variations on the paintwork, and that just makes it fun as the builder. So... First thing I just want to talk about is with the types of paints that are used. One thing about boats and it makes them so much more simpler compared to tanks is that you can just use the most off the shelf paint you possibly can. For the black, this is nothing more than El Cheapo flat black spray paint. In fact, the entire vessel's painted in that as a base coat and as a primer. And oddly enough, for the primer, this is actually just Ace brand red oxide spray paint. The flat black I like to utilize before the red because this gives an extra layer of protection so in case anything gets scratched on the bottom you'll see black paint before you see bare plastic. So after the entire model is painted with the flat black spray paint I go ahead and mask everything up and I then spray the lower section with the primer red. On the primer red lower hulls you do have some options available. You can have it with the high water line or the low water line. And this one here, I'm going with the low water line, but it's a little bit different than some of the others because of the way it wraps around on the tail section. 
So with the boat and the camera readjusted, you get to see what I'm referring to. On some other boats out there, including some of the other ones that I've made, the water line's a little bit lower, and it basically cuts the fin here in half. However, on this one here, the water line's at a middle point, and then it wraps around this section here of the hull, yet the rudder here is still left all in black paint. And this is lifted directly off of a real American uh, SSBN that I was utilizing as reference when I was looking at just exactly different variations for the water line. For the paintwork on the sail, I went ahead again, rendered this vessel as representing the way it looked in the mid 1960s or late 1960s, somewhere in between. And there are several photographs of the vessel with this paint job. And on this one here, the paint is applied in a slightly different method compared to my other builds. So first for the color, this is Tamiya Panzer Gray acrylic is applied via the airbrush. However, the difference though is with the black line here found on the spine and also on the top portion of the sail. In the past, I've utilized an airbrush and I basically just fluff these areas in as per you know the real units however for this one here the vessel or the fixtures I was utilizing for reference had these painted in a clean cut format which means they were applied via the brush so after the paintwork was added I went ahead and refined these areas further with the paintbrush leading for the sharp cut paint that you see here and it's these subtle little differences like this which not only make it true to form to the real one, but it's also a great way to help add variation and break up monotony that could be found in your collection. The remainder of the paintwork was all weathering, and this is utilizing basically every trick under the sun that I've referenced in my other videos for both subs as well as also tanks. It will include counter shading with the use of an airbrush, filtering, washing, as well as dry brushing. All of those were utilized on the build to give you the results that you see presently. For weathering a submarine like this, again, a lot of people tend to over weather things where they just turn the thing into a rust bucket and that's just really not anachronistic. You really can't do that. Uh, for the sub to be that heavily rusted or any ship to be that heavily rusted, the bottom needs to be encased in biofouling. And most of the times people just throw lots of rust on the thing and call it a day. And it just, it just wouldn't be like that on the real boat. On my builds here, I like to have them where they've been in the water for not that long of a period of time, but you can definitely see the biofouling starting to take effect. And you'll see not just the biofouling taking effect, but also the salt and mineral deposits on portions on the upper hull as well as the lower hull. On the upper hull here, you'll see things like little salt streaks found on certain areas that drip water, and as well as then you will see some rust developing. The rusts are just done in small little streaks done with the paintbrush. The rusts are done in a few certain locations here or there, and you can also see some of them forming on the sail as well. And you want to follow, you know, basically how drips would flow on the real unit. And this is where you get to use some creativity in that regard. Back to the lower hull weathering, and again, I want to stress, I, I cannot stress this enough, there are some people out there that really don't understand how to weather a boat, and I've seen countless examples where waterline up, the thing's a rust bucket, waterline down, completely clean, and that is just bafflingly wacky. I, I don't know how you can even come to that conclusion to paint something in that format and thinking, yeah, this, this is actually how it would be. So, uh, back to my model over here. The bottom you will see the usage of airbrushing, you also see dry brushing, and you will see a bunch of filters utilized for this section. And the colors used on here are different compared to the colors used on the top, and this is a way to break up the waterline difference, and it really makes the hull and the top portion very different from one another. For the biofouling, this is utilizing about four or five different shades of green to represent the different shades of algae. And one thing you have to know about algae is that the closer it gets to the waterline, the more sun there is, so the more greener it's going to be. Lower on the hull, less sunlight, and therefore the algae tends to be browner in color. And you want to have a nice gradient showing this, and this is all done with the airbrush. For the scum line, this is actually done with the paintbrush method. And again, I utilize a couple versions of green as well as white in order to give the effect that you see presently. I always did like the blanket type look. I've seen this on several photographs of real submarines that are at dock, and I wanted to emulate that on the build that we have here. And it's also a similar techniques I've utilized on the other skipjacks that I've touched upon on this channel. Another thing that was utilized on this build was the Tamiya panel line accent. This was very helpful with highlighting the panel lines here found on the torpedo doors, and it was greatly used on the top section over here found on the sail, where you get to see all of the panel lines as well as those countersunk fasteners highlighted in full view.
on the rear portion here of the hull, another thing you want to mention is that it's very flat back here, and because of that, this area tends to get a lot more sunlight compared to some other areas. And because of that, you will have the blanket of algae forming in much along the format as you see here on my model. The very last thing to mention are the markings, and the markings that are on this model here are the kit supply decals. One thing that's great about the Mobius kit is that they give you the decals for all of the complement found in the Skipjack family. From Skipjack all the way to Snook, every one of them is represented on the decal sheet, which is excellent. So the stock decals were simply utilized, and the decal quality is excellent. They went onto the model without any sort of problems, and then once fit in place, the entire boat is covered in VMS matte varnish. The matte varnish does a gorgeous job with flattening everything out, making the colors look as vibrant as they do, and most importantly, sealing the decals in place. After the decals were at, uh, sealed down with the varnish, then I go ahead and blend the other draft numbers in the, on both the tail as well as on the sides over here with the same paints that I touched upon before. This is done because if you try to airbrush over decals, a lot of times you'll actually get more of an amplified ghosting effect, which is not something that you want. After the varnish is added, it flattens it to the surface, and then you could apply some of the paint and weathering the locations in order to blend it in so that it matches continuity. After the weathering was added, I simply went over these areas again with the VMS, flattening them further, leading for the end results that you see on this model. And of course it would be video malpractice if I went ahead and made this video without at least giving a cameo to the other skips that I've already completed. Here you can see all five of the boats that I've built so far in a row, starting with Skipjack 585 all the way on in the back, moving our way to Scamp, Scorpion, Sculpin, and now Shark. By the way, all of those mentioned subs have their own model showcase videos dedicated just to them, so if you're coming across this video for the first time and you're interested in checking those out, you have the links listed below in the video description. As I touched upon before, even though the Skipjack is a relatively simple submarine, there are lots of painting options available, and as you can see on the table over here, you can have a full complement of them and have no two of them look the same. Which is fantastic because you can have the full complement of boats, and each of them will have their own unique variety and flavor to your collection, and it'll just make your collection feel so much more rounded off compared to having everything myopic and painted identical. Not to mention it's also another reason to collect and build more of these models. So at the time of filming this, I only have one more of these boats left to do. And well, that's going to be obviously the subject matter for another video, which is great because I only have enough space on this table here for one more boat. So it's advantageous for everyone. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 172nd scale USS Shark SSN 591 Fast Attack Submarine. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being other Skipjack class submarine model showcase videos like the ones you see on this table, as well as the usual content, which consists of small scale armor model showcase videos and larger scale armor project update videos that frequently get posted. Another way to keep in loop of new posts to content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of all the particular boats that you see here, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that you've seen on the channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components, as well as Iron Bottom Sound for the, the 172nd scale 3D printed upgrades that were seen on the models that are found here on the table. And with that, I'll see you all again on the next one. Till then.